you know, people are still joining us, but I think we're going to go ahead and get started. And I wanted to welcome everyone to our webinar. We are so happy to have you join us, taking time out of your day for us. We appreciate it. Today, we will learn about the top three challenges in multifamily and how to manage them in 2022. That's even hard to imagine, 2022, I can't believe it. But a few reminders before we get started. We are recording this webinar and we will share it with you via email within the next day or two after, after this is over with. So you'll be able to revisit this and share it with your team. In order to maximize our time together, all attendees are in listen only mode and we'd like to hear from you. So we welcome your comments and chat, just like you've been doing, keep doing that. If you have specific questions, please use the Q&A feature. So enter those Q&A or Q questions in the Q&A section and we'll address your questions at the end of the presentation. Now I'm gonna turn the time over to Melissa Palmer, our Grace Hills Business Development Manager, who will provide more information and introduce you to our other speakers. Again, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> Lynn is one of our webinar coordinators and she does so much on the back end setting these things up. So thank you so much, Lynn. Appreciate that. Thank you. As I, uh, as she said, I'm Melissa Palmer. I manage strategic partnerships for Grace Hill, which means uh, our supplier and alliance partnerships as opposed to client partnerships. We partner with companies on great content, technology, other solutions to bring our Grace Hill clients the best in breed solutions. So one of our amazing partners is with us today, Lee Slock, co-hosting this webinar. We forged a partnership with them earlier this year. And for those of you who are both Vision and Lee Slock clients, you can rejoice because Lee Slock's zero deposit training is now available in our Vision library. Uh, so if you didn't know that, please contact your account manager and they can hook you up. So with that, I will go ahead and introduce today's guests. We are so fortunate to have uh, three esteemed guests with us today. Ed Wolf is the Chief Revenue Officer of Leaslock. Uh, he's going to be our moderator. Ed leverages more than 25 years of strategic leadership experience in multifamily and technology as Chief Revenue Officer for Leaslock, where he oversees the company's next phase of growth. Previously, Ed was the president uh, of RealPage Leasing Desk Insurance, and he led business and product development to establish the firm as the largest provider of Renner's Insurance. He's also served as COO at Cortland and Chief Administrative Officer at Pinnacle. So welcome, Ed. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Melissa. Our, yeah, and our next panelist is Jennifer Stachokas. She's our Executive Managing Director of Property Management for Western Wealth Capital. Jennifer's responsible for the strategic oversight of the property management organization at Western Wealth Communities, which includes operations, maintenance, marketing, training, revenue management, technology, and human resources. Is that all, Jennifer? <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer began her career in multifamily over 20 years ago, and since that time, she served in numerous capacities at two of the nation's largest property management firms, focusing on digital marketing strategies, employee development, corporate communications, revenue enhancement, and client relations. So welcome to you as well, Jennifer. And finally, last but not least, is Teresa Perezic. She's a Managing Director, Talent Development for Property Management at Graystar. Teresa oversees the talent development business for Graystar's property management business, including developing and implementing the strategy, platform, and infrastructure corresponding tools, resources, and technology to support leadership development and succession management practices. Teresa has been um, a multifamily professional since 1991. And prior to joining Graystar, she was Senior VP of Talent Solutions uh, for Santender Consumer USA, VP of Training for RealPage, and first Vice President of Organization and Talent Development for Equity Residential. Phew. We have some amazing guests with us today. You guys are, uh, we're so happy to have you. I know we're gonna have some great conversations. So thank you so much for being here today. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ed, our moderator. So take it away. Thanks, Melissa. And good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. It looks like we've got representation nationally and in Canada. And I saw a few people from uh, South America. So. We're thrilled uh, to have you and to spend the next 45 minutes with us. So first, let's touch on a high level 
um, on what's on the horizon for multifamily uh, and how as operators can you capitalize on, on what you learned today to position yourself for 2022. So first we're gonna explore the biggest challenges that we see facing the industry next year. Um, and then we're going to look at NOI opportunities. At the end of the day, right, it's all about NOI and driving and maximizing property performance. And then we're gonna turn it over to our esteemed panel. These are two industry titans that we're fortunate to have with us today because they've seen the movie. They know how to operate in good times and in not so good times. So I'm thrilled because they're making my job that much easier as a moderator uh, to talk about what their thoughts, ideas, and perspectives are as it relates to where we're headed in 2022. So our goal for today is for you to leave with a few takeaways on how to deal with these issues uh, as the multifamily landscape continues to change. And we're gonna frame these opportunities so that your organizations can successfully navigate them in 2022. Okay, let's, uh, let's kick it off and um, let me provide some context for today. So we partnered with Grace Hill and we released the 2021 Apartment Visionaries Research Report that surveyed nearly 300 multifamily owner operators to, uh, to uncover the primary asset performance challenges facing the industry. So no surprises, but the number one, 53% uh, said that hiring and retaining talent was the biggest challenge facing uh, their organization. Again, we've heard, and we'll talk about this um, in, in a few minutes, uh, but, but that's no surprise. And it's not just facing our industry, it's facing really every industry. The, the second one uh, was on delinquent rent and, and mitigating bad debt. Again, no surprise based on the unprecedented, unprecedented times that we've experienced over the last two years, starting with COVID in 2019. And then the, the third biggest challenge, which represented 30%, is on new and changing legislation. And what we know, right, through our friends at the National Apartment Association and the National Multi-Housing Council and their government affairs teams led by Cindy Cheedy and Greg Brown, they're working on our behalf on the Hill, right, to promote renter's choice, to promote housing affordability. These are real issues facing our industry. Uh, and these are challenges that each of you are having to navigate. These two panelists today are gonna help us and give you their thoughts, ideas, and perspectives on what you can do today to prepare for the future. Let's take a closer look. So hiring and retention, right? A recent report from the National Apartment Association shows a similar trend in which nearly three quarters, 74% of respondents selected HR and staffing recruitment as one of their top three challenges. Half of them noting it as their primary challenge. Think about where we are and how we've gotten here, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit about what you've heard um, in terms of the great resignation, it's real, right? The problems and challenges are things that these organizations are dealing with every day, all day. And so no surprise that that's the number one challenge that is impacting our industry. Number two, right, is our, on delinquency and bad debt. Again, as we enter as we, sorry, as we leave this post-pandemic, um, the financial risk, the delinquency and bad debt is going to continue to be top of mind. 41% of respondents cited this as a top challenge. And our research reveals that financial guardrails like security deposits, rental assistance, flexible rent, aren't always the, a sufficient tool to protect against rent loss and damages. 
But two thirds of those respondents also said that unit damage and expenses actually exceeded the deposit amount. Again, should be no surprise, right? Because what we know is security deposits have not changed. They've been around since the 15th century and collecting a security deposit never covered your um, loss in the event of damage on move out. And then lastly, uh, the, the new and changing legislation, we're seeing this and we'll talk about it in a little bit, pending and past legislation is sweeping the nation. You're seeing cities like Atlanta, like Cincinnati, that are advocating for renter's choice. And, and so we'll discuss here the urgency around these challenges, what potential tools look like, and what are the strategies that you can deploy as our industry navigates through this uh, new competitive landscape. Okay, biggest opportunities for NOI. So considering the challenges I just listed, what are the biggest opportunities to maximize NOI? And how are you thinking about that in 2022? Here's what we're hearing. I wanna talk about technology and automation. I wanna talk about how we can bring about measurable efficiency by leveraging technology. I wanna focus on the resident experience, right? I wanna talk about amenity pricing. I wanna focus on rent growth. I wanna, I need to put a talent retention strategy in place. The, the, the cost of losing an associate, the cost of onboarding an associate, You'll hear Teresa and Jennifer talk about this. They've both been responsible for talent development. Um, it's costly. Um, ancillary income. How can I help improve the bottom line um, by driving ancillary income uh, to help maximize NOI? These are just a few of the opportunities uh, that you can leverage going into 2022. Okay, next slide. So let's talk. Uh, so first, for those of you that did not get a copy of this survey report, Leaselock and Kingsley, which is now part of the Grace Hill family of companies, uh, put together this survey report. Over 300 people responded. It, cre it contains data analysis, it talks about key trends and findings, and it also provides actual insights. Remember, none of this is worth anything unless it's actionable and that you actually take away something from it. So if, if you can take a minute with your phone and scan the QR code, you will get a copy of this survey report, which then you can share with your manager and perhaps your manager's manager and your leadership team at your organization um, as you prepare for 2022. So before we start running through the panel questions, I just want to point out that these questions were derived from the challenges that we just covered earlier, and they were identified by owners and operators that are just like you. The goal here is to spark important discussion around the very topics our industry deems as high priority as we get ready for 2022. We have selected two of the finest individuals that I consider industry friends, but also are considered industry titans in Teresa and in Jennifer. Um, and they're gonna share their perspectives. So if you're not ready, get your paper, get your pen, start taking copious notes because what these ladies are here to share with you is only gonna be heard here today. So let's get started on question number one. The great resignation, it's real. It's, it's, it's actually becoming more and more pervasive. I'm seeing it at least lock. I'm seeing it with my industry peers. And I know from talking with Jennifer and Teresa, that they are equally experiencing the great resignation. What I want to talk about today is what strategies should organizations be looking to implement to not only improve the hiring process, 
but equally as important on the employee retention process. And so I want to kick it off with Teresa, um, who is managing director for talent development at Graystar. Uh, Teresa, I can't even yep. keep track of how big Graystar has gotten. I think it's what, 800,000 units or some um, crazy number. And how many associates uh, do yeah. you all have? And so I'll kick it over to you. Yeah, we have more than 20,000 uh, team members worldwide, Ed. Um, you know, we're an international company um, and super fortunate to be part of such an organization that really makes strong investments in people. And, you know, I think that's where I would start, Ed. You know, I really kind of tend to think about this topic very holistically when we think about talent in general. You know, people quit people. They don't quit companies, bottom line. Um, and so it's really imperative that firms recognize how their influence on people really impacts their talent landscape. I was reading a great article from McKinsey, um, and for those that don't know McKinsey, they're a consulting and research firm. Um, they put out great information. Um, and this particular article said that 74% of people who describe their relationship with their manager as very good are truly satisfied with their job. I also believe that business is a collection of people um, serving the business purpose, right? So it's imperative that firms consider how they invest in their people to serve that business purpose. Um, according to that same McKinsey article that I just mentioned, employees expect their jobs to bring a significant sense of purpose to their lives. And it's imperative that employers uh, really help them meet this need or they have to be prepared to lose their talent to companies that will. And I start here, Ed, because I believe that it's a holistic approach to looking at how we um, source, secure, grow and develop and retain talent over time. It's not just about hiring. It's really, really important that organizations consider that holistic approach, kind of following the talent life cycle to some degree as well. Um, and I think when organizations have a better handle on that, and they think, act, and behave more strategically and in a more people-centered way, it really gives them an opportunity to look at talent differently, both internally and externally. And, you know, I also believe that sometimes organizations uh, may not look at their internal talent pool the same way they look at their external talent pool. I, th I think sometimes that external, external talent pool outweighs the internal talent pool. And so I think that's another area of focus for organizations to really think about um, when they think about their hiring practices, um, not just taking a comprehensive approach, but really thinking holistically about the talent that they have. Um, as I mentioned, I do feel it's important that organizations follow a talent life cycle because it gives them a framework to connect hiring to people investments. And that's what it's all about. When employees can see a roadmap that a company is established to invest in them, and then they feel it and they experience those investments, gosh, they feel so much more connected to an organization and they get sticky over time, right? So that makes them less li likely um, to leave an organization and seek other employment. And when I think about a talent life cycle, and let me give you a little bit of insight on that. Um, it's really strategically looking at hiring practices including how an organization is showing up to the general public, um, their attractiveness, the attractiveness of the opportunities that they have available. It's also ensuring that applicants um, can easily um, find those opportunities, right? And streamlining hiring practices, um, including using technology like artificial intelligence and chatbots to help candidates find the right opportunity that aligns with them. But it doesn't stop there. Because organizations also, when they find that talent or they tap into their existing talent pool, they have to assimilate that talent and make sure that that, that that talent really understands the job role, the organization, how they can advance in the organization. You know, it's giving them opportunities to network. Um, it's giving them mentoring opportunities. It's giving them skill building opportunities. And again, it doesn't stop there because organizations have to think about how they grow and develop talent by establishing a comprehensive learning and development framework from skill development to management development to leadership development, to personalized development. You know, this really does give employees the opportunity to network within the organization and get better connected. And then when for firms can really 
foster engagement through culture feedback and recognition, um, you really get a good, um, you know, kind of framework and foundation um, for employees to really feel connected. Um, and I believe that that's a really important point today. Employees have to feel more connected it, it, with everything that's going on in the world today. So important that employees feel um, connected to their organization and to the people within their organization. So I would just kind of sum up by saying, you know, when you consider, um, you know, kind of a comprehensive way of looking at talent, and then you bring that forward through some succession practices, you can grow, develop, and advance talent to support both current and future state needs. And, and when I talk about succession practices, I really mean looking um, at talent using a standard set of criteria like competency behaviors and performance metrics so that we can evaluate um, talent within an identified job role. And then that gives an organization an opportunity to establish a roadmap. Um, and a consistent way of looking at talent so that we can be making really accurate, thorough, and strategic decisions when we're thinking about talent. So it's not just about going externally and hiring talent, it's really looking at this comprehensive uh, way of looking at people through people's systems, right? I know that's a lot, Ed. I'm hopeful that there are some nuggets there that remind um, our group today that hiring is centered around people practices, but it's just one component of a much larger people system. Um, and when organizations start to think about people as a system and a network, um, you know, it becomes so much more powerful for them. Yeah, Teresa, the, you know, again, you were purposefully selected because you bring this perspective both from Equity and now at Graystar, which have created incredible cultures that the, the people that were part of those organizations saw and felt valued, saw and felt included. And, um, and, and that's why you're here, right? Because your words of wisdom will provide, like you've done just now, will provide some nuggets to the folks that are on this call. Um, similarly, right? Jennifer comes from organizations, uh, Lincoln, which uh, has a history uh, of people and tenure. And now uh, Western Wealth Capital has the good fortune of having Jennifer at the helm to, to create that culture again. So Jennifer, uh, would love your perspective as you're building this from the ground up. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ed and Teresa. It's a real treat to get to partner with you on this topic, as I know we both are very passionate about people and talent development. So, so excited to share the stage with you. But one thing I think that's really important when I think about the great resignation, and if you had asked me back in the summer if we'd be in the same situation today that we were back in the summer, I would have told you absolutely not. Um, so that goes to show we just don't know what to expect. Uh, when it comes to everything that's COVID related and the last two years that we've been through. But I will tell you in starting up a management company in COVID, uh, we decided to put people first. And when you say you're gonna put people first, that means it has to start from the very beginning. And my very first corporate hire was hiring a director of recruiting. Because again, if you're gonna say you're people first, your actions have to back up the words that you're saying. And so we've made a significant investment in people and making sure that we're having the right people in the right seats. And one thing I often hear, it's so funny, Ed, that the number one thing on the survey was the challenges that executives or teams are having is talent and retention of talent but I always get the feedback, I'm too busy. I don't have time to interview. Uh, we don't have time for that. And my argument back to that is we have so many things that we're juggling on the properties at a company. The most important thing is having a fully staffed property. So your number one priority has to be interviewing and putting that first and not just checking the box with interviewing, setting aside the proper time to make sure you've reviewed the person's resume you know how their skills align with what you're looking to hire for and making sure you're really personalizing that experience. Because if you think about an interview, it's the best you're going to get from somebody. It's the best you're going to get from the candidate and it's potentially the best they're going to get from you. So if you show up unprepared and unorganized, that's not the right message for the candidate either. So my advice, my nugget here is don't be too busy to interview. That's your number one priority. And then I want to give you a couple things that we've done from a hiring perspective 
um, on ways to, to improve that hiring process. So number one, I think it's important at an organization to do a full compensation analysis. So looking at base and bonus of all positions within an organization, and we're actually in the middle of this at Western Wealth Capital. So making sure that we can't keep doing things the same way that we've always done them, because what happens? You keep getting the same results. So if wages are an actual you know, issue, which I think we all can agree to, we really need to look at that full compensation analysis. Look at not only feedback that you're getting from candidates, but also looking at research that's been done. So for instance, NMHC always does their annual salary survey, and you can benchmark what positions should be paying in particular markets. Um, I would also look at analyzing the one, the one employee per 100 units, especially as it relates to maintenance. And so that's something that I know since I've been in the industry, it has stood firm. And when I look at our portfolio, we are basically workforce housing. We buy older properties often that have deferred maintenance. And the reason we're buying them is because we can go in and add value. And so that sometimes means when you have these older properties that have deferred maintenance, there's also additional work that needs to be done. So when you're looking at your strategy around talent, making sure you're staffing appropriately for the type of asset that you have. And then a couple of things that we have looked at um, and we've been rolling out is doing benefits day one. We're kicking that off January 1st, 2022. We don't want there to be an obstacle for somebody joining our organization. Um, also, we've increased the employee discount for any employee that's on call. So we had been doing 20%, we increased it to 50% for those positions that are on call and need to be on property. Uh, we've started also offering backpacks with tools that come, you know, that come equipped with tools. So for our maintenance employees, as they get started, they have all the tools, mind you, uh, to be successful in the job. Um, we also pay for certifications and training to make sure that we're hiring and we're attracting talent from outside the industry as well, but people have the motivation and the want to join our industry. Um, and then we're also considering going to weekly pay. So I was in Kroger yesterday for my booster shot, and I noticed that they had a sign that said that you can get pay next day, which we're really seeing with the gig economy, people that are doing things with Lyft or Uber, or Uber Eats, that they can almost get that immediate satisfaction with pay. Our industry has definitely been behind the times where we're doing things. We're doing it biweekly. Some people do it twice a month. We are now looking in 2022 to start offering a weekly pay hoping that that will help our on-site associates. So just a couple ideas on the hiring front to really move the mark and make the change uh, with a candidate perspective. Well, and Jennifer, before we go to the next question, what's fascinating about that is you're seeing new technologies, which we'll talk about later, that enable flexible rent to, to specifically address the gig economy that you're talking about, right? So you know, new tools, new technologies, new approaches to an industry that really hasn't changed uh, in, in, in the last decade. So uh, love, the, love the nuggets. Okay, let's go to the next um, question. So we touched a little bit about these two ladies having the experience with great cultures. So I'd love for you to share um, with the audience, what are some things that you've either deployed or you've contemplated or you've seen work elsewhere to improve company culture. Mm -hmm. Teresa, do you want to kick us off? I sure can. Thanks, Ed. You know, this is really a big one. <laughs> uh, when we think about company culture, right, it's so critical. And, you know, just in response to the first question, you know, as I said, if people don't feel connected to an organization, they don't feel connected to the people, and they don't feel connected to the organization, um, you know, they're not gonna be sticky within an organization and they will likely um, be looking for other opportunities. So I will start off by saying, I think that's so critical. And of course, culture connects people. Also knowing that an organization cares for people, I think is becoming super critical um, because in this, you know, kind of world that we're living in today, um, when organizations can demonstrate a level of um, kind of support and well-being, um, people really see um, and find um, a different connection with that organization. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of ways, I think, um, or several strategies that firms can um, take on to implement and improve company culture. I think one of the many ways that they can do that, Ed, is through continuous listening strategies. Um, there's a variety of companies um, that offer uh, pulse type surveys. They offer full employee engagement surveys. I think that's absolutely super critical. We just finished an employee engagement survey here at Graystar. Um, and it really does give us an opportunity to hear from our employees in ways we may not hear from them on a regular basis. Um, and then pulse type surveys really give organizations the opportunity to get frequent feedback from their employees about what they're experiencing at specific identified points in time. Um, I think there's a few critical things for, for folks to consider if they're gonna consider a full-blown employee engagement survey or some type of a continuous listening strategy where you're employing uh, pulse type surveys along the way. And that's to ensure that you have relevant touch points. Um, again, I talked about the employee life cycle in our first question, and I would bring that back here and say that, you know, there's opportunities to employ um, a continuous listening strategy by using the talent life cycle so that you're not in, uh, surveying all employees all the time because they can get surveyed fatigue as well. So. I think it's really important to understand what that, what the purpose is, right? What's the business need? And then how are you going to employ that? And there's great organizations out there that offer that level of technology, rich dashboards um, so that organizations can really track and monitor um, feedback and see progress over time as well. Um, the thing I would offer here, and I'm sure this is very relevant to everyone, um, and certainly everyone's very familiar with this, but I think it goes without saying that when you ask for feedback, people expect you to do something with it, right? Um, and so it's really important that if organizations are going to employ that as part of a culture strategy, that they really do take note of what's being said. Um, and that they're doing something with it, um, communicating back to the organization and taking action on some of those critical areas. It can be more harmful to an organization, of course, to ask and not do anything than to not ask at all, of course. Um, and then I think also another uh, strategy is around recognition, um, Ed. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be some huge production uh, when you think about, you know, a company-wide recognition approach. Um, organizations can start by consistently honoring tenure. Um, I do feel like if organizations have a broader um, approach or framework around recognition, that the criteria should be based on behaviors and achievements and some kind of organizational values or pillars because then there's some measurement around it and people can connect with it. They know what they're, what they're looking at, what they're working toward, and there's a deeper connection um, to that level of recognition as well. And like continuous listening platforms. There's great technology solutions to support company recognition and peer recognition programs. Um, and it's a great way to underpin the company culture. Um, and then the last kind of thing I would say here, because this is my passion, this is the space I live in, um, this is uh, what I do every day is in the talent development space. And I think it's really, really important that organizations don't up overshadow the value of giving employees the opportunity to grow and develop in a thoughtful and structured way. Um, when employees have to figure out how they can grow and develop, they, they be, may become disengaged. Um, and so that's why organizations that have a structured talent development program or some type of infrastructure are more likely to retain employees over time because they feel like the company is making critical investments. They feel it, they see it, they connect with it, and then they see the opportunities that are available to them, whether it's advancement up or advancement out in the business. At Graystar, in our property management business, we've created a leadership culture that aligns with our organizational culture. It's one that's truly grounded in self-awareness. It starts with one's hardwiring, and it gives leaders the opportunity to explore their preferences and how those preferences influence others in their leadership role. We often refer to it as personal development in a professional setting, and it's really become a way of business and a common language within our property management business. Um, at the end of the day, I'll say it again, I think people have to feel connected um, to the organization. They have to feel connected to the people in the organization, and they certainly need to feel like the organization cares about them. Building trust and cohesion within an organization 
is so critical. It's not easy, but it's important. And again, if, if employees can kind of see the, that progressive movement through the experiences that they're having with the organization, you know, that's where that trust comes in um, and the support that, they're, that they feel um, and that they get from an organization as well. So just a, a few thoughts. Um, as we think about culture, Ed. Now, I, I love that. And, and I just want to highlight the term trust. And this was somebody that I worked with many, many years ago. And, and I thought this really resonated with me. And here, here it is. Uh, if we can't trust one another, this working relationship will never work. And it really is so profound, right? Because at the end of the day, the, the core foundation is on trust. And if you can't yeah. trust one another, if you can't trust your leadership to do what they say they're going to do, then really, does anything else really matter? Probably not. Okay, Jennifer, yes. we'd love to hear your thoughts here on culture. Absolutely. I'll keep it somewhat brief so we can keep moving. But yes. when we look at our business, you know, we look at it, look at it as a three-legged stool. So you've got our investors, we have our employees, and then we have the community. And so I'm going to focus obviously on the employee and the community side of it, because I think if you take care of employees and the community side, you, you just take care of the investor side of the business without even trying because it just happens. Uh, but I couldn't agree more, Teresa, where you have to listen to your employees but it's great to listen. But if you don't take action on what you're, you know, what you're listening to, it makes no difference. And so I wanted to give some real time feedback on things. We did, con we did start a continuous listening process with a company. We've completed our baseline survey and now we're in the life cycle of that. Uh, but prior to that, we did a benefits survey to really understand, again, with this great resignation, what are the benefits that are most important to our existing employees? And then what would benefits be uh, preferred benefits be for those new, new hires that we would bring on. And so some things that came out of it um, and then actions that we took are the number one request we had is to add more paid holidays. So we added two for 2022. We will be celebrating uh, Juneteenth and Veterans Day. Um, so that was added and it was very well received. Another thing, our number two request was that we needed to offer lower health insurance. So basically to reduce the premiums that people were paying out of pocket. And so we, we really looked at this strategically as we were gearing up for open enrollment. And we decided to contribute an extra $100 per month to each of our employees' premiums. So many of our plans now are zero premium for the employee only, uh, which really I think is a, a differentiator for us in the market, especially at the size of company that we are. We're about three to 400 employees currently. And to be able to offer benefits like that definitely puts us you know, at an advantage. We also have implemented offering short-term disability to our employees, and that's employer-sponsored. So that has become very critical as FFCRA um, expired with COVID leave. We have had people go out on leave, and if it was for longer than two weeks or the amount of time that they had accrued with sick and vacation, uh, they were going unpaid. And so now being able to offer this employer-sponsored short-term disability, we're able to really take care of our employees a little bit better. And then we also added some things as it relates to wellness. So, you know, we really, I think this is what COVID has taught us in the workplace, that it has to be a holistic approach to personal and professional. And so we were able to continue to offer our employee assistance program. We have a program called Perks at Work, where they can save money in their personal life. Uh, we also now are able to offer a merit scholarship program. So for juniors in high school, or sorry, employees that have juniors in high school, they can apply for a merit scholarship uh, for when they enter college. And then the other thing we've been able to add is a free online membership for Peloton and Apple Fitness. So again, to really tie the wellness back into our employees. And then I did wanna briefly talk about community. So this is something that is really central to our culture at Western Wealth Capital is we have two annual events that we focus on. The first is We've Got Your Back. So as the school season is getting ready to start, we offer backpacks that are completely stocked with all school supplies to every single one of our um, children that live at the communities. So we host an event, we invite all of the residents in that have children, they can pick out their backpack and oftentimes we'll invite the fire department or the police department to come and really set the stage for the school year. And then the other big event that we, we do, and we just are wrapping up actually yesterday, is our rent-free Christmas. 
We're at each one of our properties across the country. We offer a free December rent for one deserving family. And then we pull all of those stories for each of those families. And we choose anywhere from eight to 15 families that receive the full Christmas experience. So it's normally valued about $750 where we'll either buy their Christmas tree, we'll buy their meal for Christmas day. Um, and most common, what they want is gifts and especially if they have children. So we'll get their wish list of gift items. We will then go out and buy those gifts, wrap them. And then we have the family come in and we do a presentation to show them just how much we care um, about them as our resident. So those are just two ways. I think it's really central to our culture. And the feedback we get from employees when they get to participate in giving back to the community is what keeps them in the organization and makes them want to participate more. Love that, Jennifer. Okay, we've got to definitely move quickly because we're running out of time. So let's go to question three. And I would just ask Teresa and Jennifer to just touch on one item and then we can move forward because I don't want to run out of time and then miss the window. So considering the, t the talent problems we've talked about, are there tech solutions that you um, have either deployed or are considering uh, for next year? Yep, I can kick that one off. So I have three things, listening tools, which we've already talked about, highly recommend for companies to implement. Um, also making sure you have a great LMS. So we're here on Grace Hill's webinar, uh, making sure you have that LMS in place so you can give people the tools to be successful in their role. And then my number one thing is having a great ATS. So that applicant tracking system, make sure that you're also doing other things to supplement it. For instance, having LinkedIn recruiter seats, um, utilizing Indeed, and utilizing your own employees to get the word out about open positions, as well as share the message on culture. So that's one thing, if you follow Western Wealth Communities, we'll see we're, you'll, you will see that we're very active, especially on LinkedIn. And we promote all of the things that we're doing internally and externally to try and allow a candidate to see what it would be like to work at our organization. Yeah, to your credit, Jennifer, because I am following Western Wealth, I love the whole gift-free Christmas campaign. Um, I think it's a wonderful uh, give back to the community and it's just a wonderful testament and, and a, a little alignment of who Western Wealth is, um, which appeals to those individuals that are looking for a place to call home. So kudos to you. Teresa? Yeah, you know, I agree with everything Jennifer said. So the only thing I would add there, Ed, is, um, you know, again, just underpinning artificial intelligence and machine learning um, in all aspects of the talent, um, you know, kind of life cycle. Um, when there is a push methodology, um, you connect uh, employees more. Um, to that um, element, whether it's from a learning and development perspective or, you know, some other continuous li listening platform, um, when they have to go pull, um, it makes it really hard. So if you can use artificial intelligence to serve up to your employees, it gets them more engaged. Um, and then just using full technology suites, suites to engage team members in a purposeful way. We use teams at Graystar. Um, and so during our leadership development sessions, you know, we use all the technology, breakout features, chat functions, polling functions. We've gotten better about using subject matter experts to engage in discussions and share experiences to support learning applications. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of technology that doesn't take a lot. Um, and I think when you look at, you know, what's available um, through that technology and you really um, use it to its potential, um, that's where you get the full potential from it. Yeah, very true. Good point. Okay, let's go to the next question. And um, and so we touched a little bit about tools, um, but let's we're going to shift our focus here to the number two biggest challenge that was talked about, which is on delinquent bad rent, right? Eviction moratoriums have been lifted. Uh, and so what are you looking at to uh, protect against uh, rent loss and mitigation of bad debt and to ensure residents receive rental assistance. Jennifer, you wanna kick that off for us? Absolutely, so I'll touch on three different things and I'll try and be brief. So first is flexible payments. That was something that we launched during COVID and it was extremely successful. So again, the majority of our portfolio is workforce housing. Um, so people, again, what would, you know, we're talking about employees wanting to get paid more frequently. When we think about rent, it's so old school to think about only paying rent on the first of the month. 
So we were able to offer a lot of our employ I'm sorry, a lot of our residents the ability to play at any point in time throughout the month. It was a win-win for us. We got the money in the bank on the first of the month. The resident had the flexibility to pay when it was suitable for their schedule and that kept them there longer. So that was fantastic. Um, we also you know, did lease insurance. So we were able to eliminate deposits. So we get more coverage for our properties. Um, that, and again, there's an increase of damage that's happening at the communities, especially during COVID. This now gives us increased coverage to cover those damages. We can reduce that financial burden up front. So again, as people are very sensitive going through COVID, people that had lost their jobs, lost a bunch of income, they don't have a lot of money to put up front for a security deposit. We were able to eliminate that. And it also helps from a reputation perspective. So when we are looking at ratings and reviews, one of the number one things that really disappoint people is not getting their security deposit back in a timely manner. So if we can just eliminate that altogether, it just reduces that friction. If they move out on a positive note, we don't have to worry about anything being delivered to them after the fact. And then one other thing I think that you can really focus on is mandatory renter's insurance and then making sure you have asset protection. Um, we have asset protection with $100,000 of liability um, for each of our covered units. So that again, allows us in partnership with our security deposit coverage, um, as well as those flexible payments to really reduce bad debt. Teresa, anything you wanna add to, to this? Uh, so, because uh, I know we're getting running out of time. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't have anything to add here. Thank you, Ed. Okay, great. Let's go to the next question. Um, so we touched on this a little bit earlier. Legislation is another, the top three challenge that is facing our industry. So uh, what new laws have particularly had an impact on your firm's operations? And so I'm going to kick this off because I'm very close to it. And, um, you know, as, as some of you may know, lease lock is a security deposit replacement. Uh, we are lease insurance, and we uh, have been ver working very closely with the National Multi-Housing Council and the National Apartment Association and their government affairs teams. We actually have a government affairs division that is working with the lobbyists on the Hill, and it's specifically around the runner's choice and the legislation that, and that is impacting the, the renter and housing affordability. So what's happened in the Atlanta, what's happened in Cincinnati, what's happening in Pennsylvania, what's happening in California, we believe that this pending and passed security deposit legislation is going to sweep the nation. And so how do organizations deal with that? The way to do that is to get out of the security deposit business altogether. And there are solutions to do just that. Um, so, uh, that's, you know, primarily, you know, with the eviction moratoriums being lifted, um, these solutions are ensuring that the operators remain compliant. Um, and there are a whole host of other things that are impacting, um, our space, right? It's, uh, all about vaccine mandates. And so, uh, Teresa and Jennifer would love your thoughts. I know you've talked about some recommended resources, um, with Gardner and McKinsey. Anything you want to add to this before we move on to the next question? Sure, I can definitely um, pipe in on this one. So I think the thing that keeps me up at night most recently, so last year at this time, if you'd asked me, it would have been the eviction moratorium and how we're dealing with, you know, collecting rent payments um, and getting assistance for residents. But at this point, uh, with the pending legislation around vaccine mandates, that's something that we change our mind on. We discuss back and forth um, over and over. Um, you know, the potential legislation would go into effect January 4th. So really deciding how we're going to manage that and how we're going to approach it moving forward without hurting our talent development efforts, as we talked about at the beginning, because the workforce is very limited on the pool that you can pull from, but also keeping our employees and our residents safe and protected. So that's something that definitely we're, we're trying to figure out with the legislation, how do we staff appropriately to be able to um, handle those mandates, be it with the vaccine mandates or if we're going to do testing on a weekly basis. So it's a lot to think about. I'm um, certainly not here to give my opinion on what I think others should do, but it is something that companies really need to be aware of and be having those conversations. For sure. Okay, let's go to the next uh, question. 
Um, so what, what game-changing innovations do you believe are transforming our industry? Teresa, you want yeah, sure. I can share just a little bit here. I know in the interest of time, you know, I, I think I'm probably going to go back to some things I said earlier, Ed. And, and again, I tend to think about things and talk about things through a talent lens. Um, I also look at it from a, a um, kind of organizational, like a just a business perspective, not necessarily rental housing. I think the one thing um, that most organizations have is some type of a human capital management system. Um, and so, you know, from a talent perspective, I think when organizations can capitalize on their human capital management system, it gives them a lot more touch points um, using that technology, um, you know, to really engage um, and invest in, in their employees and team members. Um, again, I'll say, and I know I sound a little bit like a broken record, artificial intelligence and machine learning um, chatbots are ways that people engage um, externally with, you know, a variety of different consumers um, these days, you know, Amazon serves up, you know, content. When you buy something from Amazon multiple times, they're going to tell you what they th think you need. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think it's more than just learning management systems today. And when you have a human capital management solution, I think there are elements of that platform that can really serve up ways um, that you engage and invest in team members more holistically. Um, I think it's also a way to help um, organizations upskill and reskill talent, which is so important today as we think about the evolution of roles and how roles are, are quickly and rapidly changing. So just a few thoughts there, there Ed. No, thanks. Jennifer, anything you want oh. to add there? Yep, I think we've talked about quite a few technologies throughout the course of the presentation, but I would also add in, you know, business intelligence has been on many people's mind for years, but I think we're finally hitting a new chapter in that. There's some new providers out in the market, um, separate from just the PMSs. So I think there will be some additional innovation and transformation happening in that space. Um, also some additional lead nurturing, as well as social engagement for lead gen technologies that are out there to really enhance and convert leases easier and quicker. Um, and then one other thing that we didn't talk about when we were talking about flexible payments and um, lease insurance is also having credit reporting. So making sure that for those residents that have been great about paying their rent throughout COVID, where they didn't miss a payment, they were still on time, uh, we're able to reward those residents and report those positive pay on their credit. So again, I think we're going to see things that are more resident focused and then risk mitigation as well. I love that, Jennifer. I think that's an amenity and a gift that keeps on giving, especially okay. in this, in this uh, interesting period. Okay, to close it out, I want to hear uh, on question seven, what are you most optimistic about uh, for the future of multifamily? First thing that comes to mind, Jennifer? Yep, I've got two things. So number one, prop tech, fintech, and sure tech companies. I think there's a ton of innovation that's continuing to come. For the longest time, we have been behind the eight ball as it relates to technology. And I think we're finally seeing that and there's a lot of investment in our industry. And then the second thing that I'm most optimistic about is the people that weathered the storm through COVID, um, the resilience that we're going to see in those employees and the leadership that they'll be able to give moving forward um, makes me very excited because if you can make it through a pandemic um, and not knowing how to handle it, but figuring it out and being resilient, I think we have a really great bench of people that we're going to be able to pull from to lead organizations and to drive change. So very optimistic about that. Awesome. Teresa? I love that. Yes, I love that last point, Jennifer, and would absolutely um, double down on that. I would also say just in general and very broadly, innovation. You know, this, um, you know, I've been in this business a long time, and I think we um, sometimes kind of have held our, ourselves back from innovating. And I think what's happened over the last year and a half or two years has really forced us to be open, be interested, pay attention, challenge the status quo, think boldly, take risks. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's where organizations can best serve their purpose and potential um, and overall serve their people is when they're innovative and they're creative and they're thinking outside the box and they're being bold um, and, they're, and they're serving their people in a way that's going to deliver on the business purpose. Yeah. Fantastic. I really, my heartfelt thanks to you, Jennifer, to you, Teresa, for sharing your thoughts, your ideas, your perspectives, your invaluable input. 
there's such, there's a ton to be learned here. The feedback that I'm getting in the chat is overwhelming. Like from one of the best sessions they've heard, how refreshing it is. I know the audience appreciates your perspective uh, and as well as uh, buckling up for what's in store for us next year. I know I'm excited for 2022. I hope each and every one of you are as well. And so with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa Palmer with Grace Hill. Thank you guys. What an amazing time that we had today answering these questions. And I was watching the chat as well. Uh, great information, you guys. I think we have two minutes. I'm gonna read off one question if that's okay. Uh, from Doug Chasick, he asks, how, if at all, do you think the great resignation will affect nepotism policies in hiring? Does anybody have a good answer for that? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, that wasn't was a softball, Doug Chasick. <laughs> Nobody will let them think about that and um, go on to this one, one more question. So how do you handle an employee whom is actually training the directors in the organization, but they're told they're not prepared to be directors themselves? I don't know if we have enough time for that one, but. I see that one again. Tell me that one again. Yeah, how, how do you handle, handle that? Yeah, an employee who's training the directors in the organization, but then they're told they're not prepared to be directors themselves. I think that to me would be sitting down with their actual supervisor to, to unpack that and understand what that means. So if they are capable of training the employees to be in that position, why are they not able to be? So there must be something that's holding them back um, from being able to be in that role. And so I think it needs to be a very candid, transparent conversation to understand why that is and then set out a plan to be able to get them where they need to be. Uh, moving forward. I would agree with that as well, Jennifer. The other thing I would add there that's very well said, the other thing I would add is if there's some type of a job capabilities framework um, for a director that kind of lists out those kind of critical skills and core competencies, it really helps to have the conversation in a more objective way um, so that you're really looking at, you know, what's required in the role um, and where there could be strengths and where there might be some gaps. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. So we appreciate everybody's time today. I think that concludes our time. And as a reminder, we'll be sending the attendees the webinar recording as well as a link to access the visionaries report if you weren't able to scan the QR code earlier. We hope everyone can walk away from today's presentation and panel with valuable insights on how your firm can tackle the primary industry challenges coming up in 2022. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Happy holidays. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.